All right. So welcome to Chicago Sports Chat. Now on this show, um, I just decided to create this uh, this channel, the show, in order to yeah you know, just express my ideas, my views, my opinions on the latest uh, sports updates, the latest sports uh, games, seasons, preseasons, uh, off seasons, whatever you like. Uh, yeah. So um, so this show, I'll, I'll be talking about Chicago Bears football, Bulls basketball, White Sox baseball. And I'm not really a Cubs fan, but uh, when there's news, I'll, I'll be covering that as well. Um, so yeah. Oh, without further ado, let's just let's start off with the Chicago Bears. All right. So on Sunday, the Bears put an absolute beat down on the Houston Texans, and it was a blowout. And so, do we just you gotta give credit where credit is due. The Bears played an absolute great game, and they really all three phases of the of the ball. They they really did well, and the offense did its part. Even special teams came out big with pretty good plays, and the defense really did its part this time around. And so, as far as the repercussions that this game has on the future of the Bears, I I really don't think it changes much. I still think that Pace should be fired uh, by the end of this season. And now, now Nagy is more of a difficult situation. It, he's like he's locked up until 2022, and it wouldn't be very McCaskey of them to fire him after this season because they they still have another two seasons to go on his contract. So even if and if the Bears even end up like eight and eight or nine and seven, odds are really the McCaskies won't let him go. Now, as far as right now, Ryan Pace should be an easy firing, but something that's concerning is that a couple days ago, uh, Bill Zimmerman from a Series XM put out a tweet that said that Ryan Pace may have acquired a one-year contract extension prior to this season. That would line him up with Nagy's contract. And so, um, he, he later deleted that tweet, but, uh, he said that he wasn't percent, one, wasn't hundred, a hundred percent sure that, um, it was, uh, fully correct and that, um, uh, it might have been, it might have come off as misinformation, but, uh, I would take it with a grain of salt. So, um... So moving on, so for a lot of people, this season has felt like a Chicago Bears football hell, understandably so. And you know, so if I had to describe this Bears season, this Bears organization since 2019, it, it's in my opinion, I think I would describe it as a psychological mess. And now let me explain why. There are three main components of my argument, and and they're as follows: uh, Mitchell Trubisky, Matt Nagy, and Ryan Pace. And maybe, maybe towards you know this part of the se- part of the 2020 season, you could say the defense. But uh, let's see, let's see where the defense goes after this game. It looks like they got they got rolling again. So. Now, what I mean by psychological mess is that each of these guys has been affected by kind of their own mindset, their own psyche. So in my opinion, this is really messed with, uh, with these guys and obviously they're self-inflicted. So I want to start off with Mitch. We've seen Mitch play good, play average, play, play mediocre, play borderline bad and really all of the above so my point is that he's definitely been affected by the storyline of Deshaun Watson being taken I mean being skipped over by Ryan Pace Patrick Mahomes being left on the board and the fact that Deshaun Watson has seen a lot of success and I know he might have he might have defeated these demons the game against Houston 
But I still have to say that that no matter what, he'll always be known as the guy who was taken first instead of Pat Mahomes and Deshaun Watson. And so these guys these guys take it personally. I mean, really who can blame them? He had no control over what was gonna happen that night and who was gonna be taken. He had no control over that. So and you have to believe that it does affect them. Because they during their personal time they they probably think about it a lot and it's probably a big inspirational factor. If not it's it if it doesn't inspire them, doesn't pump them up, then it possibly just, just defeats them mentally. And so so what we do know we, but we don't know to what extent that does affect them or that does boost his his uh, his play or whatever, right? So what we do know a bit Mitch, about Mitch Trubisky is what he can do right. So his strengths are that he can he can play well with play action. He can scramble. He he's pretty okay at the throw and run. And he's pretty solid at throwing down the middle. Now, what he's bad at is reading defenses, making smart decision making, throwing accurately, sometimes to the sides mostly. And and you know, he's he's just not as good of a play reader. He's he doesn't make good decisions. So so when when you and you have someone like Bill Lazor who has attempted to put in put in and use the good parts use the strength of Mitchell Trubisky in order to get 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 better results it and it's showing but we we know he can be at least average against subpar defenses now his ability now his ability against better defenses is up to question but we'll see, really, we'll see. So, really, my point was is that that Mitch Trubisky has has uh, I think has been affected by his own mindset before, even before, even after. I mean, at, even apart from the draft, it's just he's he hasn't had he hasn't seen that much offensive success, and he's just defeated by the, by the fact that uh, he has to. He has to really just try to make something out of nothing in some cases, really. But that that is that is just my thoughts on Mitch Trubisky and his his mindset that he he isn't really that good of a a, a play caller or not a play caller, someone who can read defenses. He's not that good at making good decision making, and really a testament to this can be the benching. After Mitch Trubisky was benched, now he comes in with a different mindset. He comes in thinking, "Okay, I have nothing to lose. I just need to ball out. I I need to. I want this team to win, and so I have to ball out. And you know, we'll see where it goes. And it's it's worked out so far. And hopefully, he does keep playing well. But we'll see because he still has to go against the Minnesota Vikings defense. I know it's not as good, but it's definitely. I know it's not as good as it's been before." But definitely better than a Houston Texans defense. I'll tell you that. And he has to go against the Green Bay Packers as well. That's going to be tough. So, now Nagy. Moving on to Nagy. Nagy's just so stubborn. And it's like he likes shiny things. He brought, he was brought in as a quote-unquote offensive guru. Right? And really, it hasn't worked out that way. Because he's really tried to force in a new system, an offensive system that is designed is they call it the West Coast defense, uh, offense, rather, and and the whole premise of this is to have heavy route running, and and rely on the quarterback to make good throws, wherever whatever that may be, and it allows for less time in the pocket. Now, what do you know? Those are a couple of the weaknesses that Mitch Trubisky does. He's not good under pressure. 
And when you have a bad offensive line, it's not going to work. And it's been no surprise that this offense hasn't seen any success under that system. This is why Matt Nagy had to give up excuse me, play calling duties. Now, when Nick Foles said that he'd rather win ugly than lose pretty, this brings up another problem with Matt Nagy, is that he was definitely not talking about Coach Nagy in that quote. I mean, you just look at the Detroit Lions game. He, instead of running the ball at the end of the game, or, or rather throwing the ball at the end of the game, before in the before the Lions had had that massive turnover in order to take the lead in the red zone, they they should have ran the ball, and they used bad play calling. They, and Matt Nagy did re- some really bad play calling, or they called a really bad game right there because they utilized the weaknesses of Mitchell Trubisky. And what happened is that the weak offensive line was exploited, and that caused the turnover. Which is, it was just game changing. And then at the end of the game, you, you blow it. You just blow it. And he likes to win nice. Like he, this is why the the lead was blown, because he wants to win in a certain way. And that just, when you're in the National Football League, you you have to be grateful for every win that you get. It's not as easy as you know some people may take it for. And that's just. That, that right there is just an example, really. And now, Ryan Pace. Really, Ryan Pace has just... It's his ego that gets in the way because it's the level of conviction that really gets people because he was so locked in into Metro Trubisky that he decided not even to talk to Deshaun Watson not even to scout him, I mean, not to scout him, that, like, have, di- they had dinner, he had dinner with Major Trubisky, but he didn't do any of that with Deshaun Watson, let alone Patrick Mahomes, so now, now his decision making also has been really questionable, he's paid these offensive linemen, Charles Leno, and he's paid them, he's paid him, he's, like, what top top seven in the payroll? It's it's unreal. It's it's unexcusable to pay this amount of money for an offensive line when you should be giving that money to a guy like Allen Robinson. And it's just it's just unbelievable that Ryan Pace still has his job, and it's just horrible decision making. Hor- just the false the level of false conviction on him is unreal, and. That's really one of his weaknesses, is that he's been affected that, by that because he has had a huge level of false conviction. He thinks he's right, but he's not. And he he seems to not accept when he's wrong. And I hope, I really, I, I don't hope, but well, I mean, I guess now I do hope that that leads to his, his demise. In Bears and the Bears organization, because he should not return for another year in the Chicago Bears front office. I'll tell you that. So the Bulls preseason has gone underway, and I watched the first game. I'm gonna be honest. I I didn't watch the second game uh, against the Rockets. But uh, there were a lot of takeaways that I, I saw in, in the Bulls, the Bulls game against the Rockets, where they got pretty much utterly destroyed. And so, here, here, here are the takeaways that, that I, I, I observed, my observations based on that game, and really the takeaways, because honestly, the, this, this season, it's, it's great to see the Bulls back in action after just Horrible seasons, horrible, just a horrible era led by Jim Boylan. And it's awesome to see the new front office and uh, finally the, the Reinsdorf, Jerry Reinsdorf, giving, giving, the, giving the direction, giving, giving, giving way for his son to, take, to take, the, take the Bulls team and really try to do something with it. And so 
really props to Arturis Karnasovas for getting his top his top tier uh, coaching candidate, who is of course Billy Donovan, just awesome. And so, so here the here the takeaways that I took away from from the first game in the preseason. So really, um, what the Bulls need is they need more communication. It, it really seemed like they were just, sometimes they were out of it, they were confused, they didn't know where to go. They're, they're just, they were a lot of bad passes and it was really bad organization and very bad pick and rolls. And so they were, apart from bad passes, um, they, this, this team just very sloppy. It was very sloppy. And what it needed is uh, more organization just more discipline, just in general. Uh, there were a lot of bad habits that, that may have been left over from the Jim Boylan era, but a lot of bad habits, and a lot of players got stuck on screens. And again, just horrible passes. Um, Wendell Carter played just horrible in the first game. I'm going to be honest, I didn't watch the second game, but in the first game, he, he went over 5 in the first half on 3-point shots. It just that that's 15 points right there, man. You gotta make those. Um, the, he was pretty wide open for most of them too, so he's gotta make those. And um, another takeaway is that um, they were there was um, there's a lot of work to do really, but um, I thought that Kobe White really tried, really did seem to try to do a bit too much uh, in that at least the first half of the first game. Uh, might have just habits, but. Um, Really, really, he he really tried to do too much, in my opinion. Uh, really needs more discipline. Um, so the main takeaway, at least for me, in the first game, is that really Billy Donovan has his work cut out for him this season. Uh, obviously, the second game was was huge, just a emotional booster for the, the Chicago Bulls team. Very young, by the way. And and again, and one of the one of the really bright spots of these games is that Pat Williams, Patrick Williams, has arisen as one of the bright spots in this team. And it, a lot of people are saying online that he's the Kawhi 2.0, but uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Uh, he's uh, he's been playing pretty good though, and it's awesome to see that. It's I'm so excited for this upcoming bowl season. It's just gonna be great. It's going to be great. All right. So, baseball. Um, I'll just address the Cubs real quick. Uh, obviously, it's an it's kind of a new era that's going to arise in Cubs baseball. They're, they're definitely... I don't think they're going to be as good this upcoming season. With Given the fact that uh, they're going to lose a couple pieces. And they may or may not trade uh, Chris Bryant. But... As far as what's gonna happen, I think that um, it's gonna be a new time for the for the Cubs. They're gonna be they're they're not gonna be contenders, but they're they're gonna be playoff contenders. They're gonna be there. They're gonna be in the conversation, and I think that they're they're I think I think Jed Hoyer is gonna do a good job balancing uh, to prepare for the future as far and really play well now, focus on the now, and also have on your rear view mirror. Or rather, in your front view mirror, or front view mirror, on your just just on your watch, have that have that thought that hey, we have to prepare for the future here. And so, all right, let, let's talk about some White Sox baseball now. Really, a lot of people for a lot of people, the main complaint is that Jerry Reinsdorf is very cheap, and rightfully so. The lack of spending that they make. Is, calls for very questionable decisions sometimes just even the Tony Tony LaRusso hiring just questionable just why would you do that but that's besides the point in the long run so really the reasons are obviously sustainability and past the rebuild phase uh, going into like 2024 2025 even 2023 for that matter Um, the idea is really and I'm out of my depth when we're talking about salary cap and all that things, the finances. I don't really know much, but what I can, what I, I want to say is that the the White Sox are going to be paying less now 
in order to really not not kill the salary cap and um really pay pay their stars like Luis Robert, Elo Jimenez, uh, Tim Anderson, uh, who else? Uh, Adam Angle even. I include include those guys. Look at Chilito. Uh, may, maybe even Dylan Cease. And uh, I don't know, maybe I, I keep better in Dallas Keiko. And just pay them uh, during their primes. And so that's the main idea in, in my opinion is that that's I really I think that's what the Adam Eaton trade is uh, Adam Eaton signing is about, and hopefully I mean hopefully that's what the Adam Eaton tra- uh, signing is about, and the Alliance Lynn signing. Obviously, it's difficult to say goodbye to one of your pitchers who pitched pretty well over the course of this sixty game season. Now, um, another reason that I think it's good that the White Sox are not spending so much right now as it stands is that. Really, a 60-game season uh, doesn't really put into perspective the entirety, entirety, just the entire season. And remember, we had more playoff spots. We had a lot of other circumstances that really allowed for maybe easier play for the White Sox. Not to say that they're bad. I don't want to take any way, anything away from them. But who knows? Maybe next year, uh, okay, Moncada keep slumping let's say at least robert just has a very disappointing season and for example Eli jimenez just gets injured for example just examples here i god forbid but just examples here now those things will not allow for the usage appropriate usage for lance land and just it would really kind of be a, just it'd be a disappointing season really and um that's just got to be taken into account that a 60 game season does not they really pony up for this position is this position is Liam Hendricks or a closer really because that's going to be the biggest thing that they want to retain either Alex Colome or or really spend free agent money on Liam Hendricks that would be huge for the White Sox and that outfielders um in the White Sox so that that sets that and so Really, one more addition that I would make would be adding a another starting pitcher, but this one as an insurance policy. Let's say, God forbid, <laughs> it's a, who you put at the starting spot. Are you going to call up someone someone from the minors? Uh, what I would do is I would sign someone like Jose Quintana, have a reunion with him. Jose Quintana, in order to have him as kind of an insurance policy, have him start maybe sometime every... Every who knows, but every tw- twelve days, who knows if Dylan sees has a disappointing season. If Michael Kopech can't start in in the season, can't start until like maybe mid season, later in the season, you have Jose Quintana as your fifth pitcher, and that way you don't have to put push in a pitcher who's unprepared. And if if all things go well, I think that this would be great for the White Sox. If the, if if all things go well. The White Sox should be a top contender in the AL Central. Not not just the AL Central, the entire AL. They'd be that'd be huge. So that's just my opinion, and um, I think that you know if the White Sox can make these moves, if the White Sox can do to do as follows, if they do something similar, even I think they're prime for a very good season and a very good. And possibly a, a World Series run. So, this this I, I can't wait for this upcoming season, and it's gonna be it's gonna be great. It's, it's, uh, just hope that everything goes well, and that not many mistakes are made, not not many trades are made in this offseason. But you don't want to give that many assets to other teams, and retain your players really. So, yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, this uh, episode of uh, Sports Chat, Chicago Sports Chat Weekly. And so, yeah, um, that was it for this episode. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. And uh, just, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. From winning by a lot to losing a tight race, it's corrupt. Detroit is corrupt. 
I have a lot of friends in Detroit. They know it. But Detroit is totally corrupt. 